That was delightful, Miss Phelps. Really, really beautiful and so meaningful and appropriate, along with the presentations we had today. We've had a lot of happy Sabbath, Sabbathing, if that's a thing already, but I always like to get a good one in. So happy Sabbath, brethren. Glad to see you here. And I apologize that two microphones are throwing me off a little bit there. But today I'd like to talk to you about something that I think is appropriate for the time that we're approaching the Feast of Pentecost. And we've been counting, right, towards that. What force keeps us in touch with God's truth? As was mentioned uh, a little earlier, a lot of the world doesn't have a clue about the truth of God. But we're here because God has opened our minds, he's invited us in, and he says, I want you to know something. God's truth, his teachings, his purpose for our being born, what keeps us in touch with that? What set of circumstances or influences have been at work that you and I should sit here in the church of the great God? What power holds you and I together as a church body? There's a direct tie in to these questions that begs us to consider the importance of our observance of the Feast of Pentecost this next week. That brings us to what I would like to talk about today in this message that I've entitled, What Does God's Holy Spirit Do? I have an article from United Church of God it's from when we had the Good News magazine, right? We have Beyond Today now, but when it was, we had the flagship uh, Good News publication. And it's entitled, What Does God's Spirit Do For Us and In Us? And it's a, a short article, but impactful. And I just want to read you an introduction from that. It says, so just what does the Holy Spirit do for us and in us? God's Spirit is both powerful and practical. It is powerful for it comes from God. It is a part of him. God, through the one who became Jesus Christ, created the universe through his great spirit of power. And it cites Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The Holy Spirit is God's divine spirit of power, citing Acts chapter 1, verse 8. God's spirit is also practical. Through the Holy Spirit, human beings can live in a more productive and fruitful way. I thought that was a very good short synopsis of the power of God's Spirit. We know that the power of God's Spirit is multifaceted, right? It's not just one way or the other. It's coming at you from different directions, inside out, outside in, all around 360. You, know, you get these 360 feedbacks at work. I don't know if anybody's been through that. That's fun. <laughs> you, you, get, uh, you get people that effectively instead of your boss just giving you a review everybody in the company is asked what they think about you and how you produce stuff and so you're getting it from all angles and hopefully it all comes back uh, pretty good you know sometimes you get that constructive criticism with that that's not what we're talking about here we're talking about the work of god's spirit which is multifaceted and sometimes it's a little bit rough things get shaved off but mostly we're being led gently is my experience with it you know with this multifaceted nature of god's holy spirit we may overlook the work that god has designated for his spirit to actually accomplish in us so let's dig into a few specifics today about what god's spirit can and should be doing in each of us and as i was growing up in the church there used to be kind of this cadence of a message uh, where they would tell you what they're going to tell you, then they tell you, and then they tell you what they told you, right? Well, I'm going to take that same cadence because it's comfortable for me, right? So today I've got three things that we're going to cover. And that's not, it's not, you know, exhaustive about the uh, 
the Holy Spirit and what it does, but it's emblematic and I think we're catching the main uh, portion. And so the first one of those things that God's Spirit does in us and for us is God's Spirit provides the ability to address our weaknesses. It provides the ability to address our weaknesses. You know, Peter was personally taught by Jesus Christ about how to have conviction and belief and how to have faith in those convictions. Peter watched Christ perform numerous miracles right there up front. He had a front row seat to these in person. Peter was the only one of the disciples to know, absolutely know that Christ was the prophesied Messiah. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 17. Let's read that. What did Peter say? I ask for you um, to bear with me. I'm, I'm getting used to a new Bible also, uh, graduates. You got a nice, bold type print one that uh, the Merigians uh, gifted me, and I am loving it because I can see everything. In fact, sometimes I got to take my glasses off because, you know, it comes right off the page there. All right. I'm talking instead of turning. Let me get to doing that. 16, uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, and we'll read through verse 17. We're talking about what the Holy Spirit does here. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, who do you, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the son of the living God. And what does it say? Flesh and blood has not given that to you. That's from the Spirit, right? Only the Holy Spirit could have done that for Peter. So with that declaration, right, how could the following happen in Matthew chapter 26? Same guy, right? Peter, different time. Matthew 26 and verse 69 through 75, Peter denied Jesus Christ. He was so sure and convicted when he was asked directly who Christ was. But verse 69 of Matthew 26 says, now Peter sat outside in the courtyard. This is after the, the scourging, the trial, the scourging, the death of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. This is not after his death. I correct myself. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. So powerfully, he said, I know who he is. I know you're the Christ. You were sent by God. And here, I don't know him. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. You know, he got an accent. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus who said to him, before the rooster crows, you will die, deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. We put ourselves in Peter's shoes there. Man, how demoralized, how out of sorts, how like out of body would you feel if that was you and that was your experience? Well, what happened? You know, God's spirit was definitely working with Peter aforetime. He answered correctly. But Peter was not harnessing it to stand for what he knew in those moments when the pressure was on. Humility was what Peter was left with at its basis level. 
Peter did not learn the lesson at first to be humble or loyal or to always harness and tie in and be led by God's spirit. After watching Christ up close and personal for three years, he still needed some work laid in to be able to apply what he had learned. I identify with that. I've been sitting in one of these seats in the church of God for a long time. I still need to lay in work. You know, if you're here, I'm guessing you probably still need to lay in some work also. We're all in the same boat. Peter was later given God's spirit in full measure on the day of Pentecost. And he actually used the power for change in himself and to serve God mightily, teaching and serving others. And in that first day of Pentecost, he got up and gave this amazing message, right? Encouraging everybody, explaining what was going on. You know, two books with his name on it, first and second Peter. What a turnaround. The power of the Holy Spirit evidenced. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's turn there. It was uh, cited in the uh, article that I read to you as the opening remarks there. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be, shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit is equated with power. The Greek word for power here is dunamis, dunamis, or some other pronunciation. I don't know. But that Greek word tells us something about this power of the Holy Spirit. It's force, it's force, specifically miraculous power, usually by implication, a miracle itself. And God's spirit dwelling in us and with us, it is miraculous. It's ability, there's abundance, there's meaning, there's might, power, strength, mighty and wonderful work. All these things apply to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. What we gather then is, is when we receive the Holy Spirit, a certain force, multifaceted force and power comes to us. One of the ways God's Spirit works with us is it brings about divine repentance to change and progress in major overcoming. Things that we just could not deal with in our lives before God's spirit is in us, we now have the power to move forward in those things. Sometimes we don't see it beforehand, or sometimes we frustrate it and see it, and then we say, okay, I got this breakthrough that happens. And sometimes it's a little bit of a mixture of both. But divine, capacity for repentance. Repentance in itself is a gift. It's not something we just go say, I'm going to repent. I've got repentance, right? You have to have a repentant mindset, but repentance is a gift from the Almighty. And it's only by the submission that we undertake to working with the leading of this divine godly power that we know as the holy spirit so that was the first thing another thing about the effect of god's spirit god's spirit provides the ability to witness the truth and deepen our beliefs and this concept of witnessing the truth i kind of view that as multifaceted in itself right I don't know, you know, if we talk about the truth, what strikes your mind? If you witness the truth, well, you can observe it and you say, that's the truth, right? I've witnessed it. Then you can also speak to the truth. I speak to what I witnesses. I know this is true. I can speak to it. And then there's an act of doing, right? It's like the first message we got today where we have this concept of 
truth embodied in our actions, our life, our approach. God's Spirit provides the ability to witness the truth and deepen our beliefs. On the witness side of this, on our witness, still in Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, what does it say there at the end of that verse? They call it part B, part C. I don't know, there's part D in here too, which is kind of interesting in this Bible. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And that last part says, and to the ends of the earth. That's still happening today. And we're part of it, right? How many miles are we away from Jerusalem? I didn't look it up. I should have. I could tell you. You know, somebody's got Google, right? Google will tell me, Siri, somebody. You don't have to do that. Please don't. <laughs> but it's a lot of miles away from there, right? We're not even at the ends of the earth, if you know, we would call it that. It's happened. It's happening. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. And verses four and five. Verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, the truth of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Our weapons aid us to cast down all arguments that are against the truth of God, the, the plain truth of God's way and what he's doing on this earth and what he's doing in us. God's spirit leads us into all truth. We are to be witnesses of how God's way works. So we not only witness the truth, we not only incorporate the truth and are able to talk about it, we are to be living the truth, a walking, talking, breathing representation of the truth of God, God's way, and how it works. God's way works. And also by the power of God working with us and in us, we hold on to the truth. And as we hold on to that truth, tighter as the pressure gets heavier, like with Peter, when you know Christ's trial was going on and he denied him three times, he didn't hold on that tight to who Jesus Christ was. Our calling is to hold on tight to what the book reveals to us and what God's spirit leads us to understand about what our walk should be and what God is doing, not only in us today, but towards his kingdom. We represent his kingdom. You know, some who are younger here, and we saw a few of those, you know, grab some, some fresh Bible there. Wonderful. Or if you're newly understanding God's truth, you are also witnessing the truth. The Holy Spirit is also working with you. You know, do not undervalue your contribution in believing God at any age. When I was laying on the carpet, okay, I was picking stuff up. And as I got older, you know, people would ask me stuff, you know, in kindergarten, why, why are you leaving school right now to go to that feast of blah, 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 whatever it is, right? <laughs> Nabber tackles is what Mr. Tuck used to say. You witness what's going on. Your understanding at that time what it is. And it's doing something when you do that. You're spreading God's way. Don't undervalue that. It's a little thing, but man, is it magnif magnified in impact. As a young person, you witness God's holy days, both by saying, I know about them, can talk about them, but going to them and doing them. As you keep them and keeping the Sabbath, you're a witness. And observing clean and unclean meats. You know what the Bible says about what you should put in your pie hole. You didn't know you had a pie hole, right? <laughs> You're a witness of what you won't eat and what you will eat and why. Where did you get that from? 
As adults and being baptized, we can have a bit more of a powerful witness, you know, as by the lives we lead, which quite often has more influence than the words we speak. You know, why do those folks go off every Saturday? Where do they go? You know, the house is kind of cleaned up every Friday. There's a preparation day. Man, that place is pew, all the leaves are blown off. And, you know, <laughs> I, I would think, you know, it came to my mind. I, I should just say it because I'm laughing at it. I'm blowing my front lawn off. I got a new blower and I'm blowing this thing off. And, you know, I blew it out into the street and I thought the wind would just take it away. You know, two days later, the stuff is still in the street out there. So I had to blow it all back over and break it up, you know. It's better just to clean it up right the first time. <laughs> I don't know what I was witnessing by that, by the way. I guess I guess when I got it right the second time, you say, okay, that guy doesn't give up. There are things we do, though, that people are watching us, right? And, you know, we're, we're not prima donnas. We don't think the world revolves around us. But as we come and go here to the feasts, you know, as we don't do this stuff on certain time frames, you know, when the parties are going on, we're absent if it's Friday night or a Saturday. That's saying something to people that are watching it. It's a witness. Our example is reflected by our commitment to never let the light of truth, this truth that you guys just received today, to look into more completely. I know you guys aren't Bible illiterate, right? But this word of truth is something that we will never let die out in our lives if God's Holy Spirit is leading us and guiding us and we are cooperating with that. Because we know to, we come to know personally that in the truth of God's word, there is freedom. Most people will want to tell you that that word that you've got sitting on your lap or in the box underneath your chair at this point, that it's going to constrain you. It's going to take away your freedom, your capacity to make a choice. True freedom is understanding the true implication of those choices that are before you in your life. John chapter eight, verse 32, you just take a note on that, read it later. It'll tell you what the impact of truth is in your life. And this spurs us on with desire, with everything to learn and grow in doing God's will and reflect the mind of Christ at work. Again, walking, talking, breathing, <laughs> evidence of God's way at work. We can sum up part of what we are to do by reading what Paul instructed Timothy to remember. First Timothy, first Timothy chapter four and verse 12. And Timothy was a young guy, right? Trying to tell a bunch of oldsters some stuff that they should be thinking about. And he was getting some flack for it. Maybe they, he was called a whippersnapper. I don't know. I think, I don't know, is there a, is there a Greek uh, equivalent to whippersnapper? <laughs> but, you know, he, he was having a tough time uh, talking with some folks that, you know, were a little bit more established. Verses 12 through 16 in 1 Timothy, what did, what did uh, the Apostle Paul tell him? Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, that word of truth, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, Impurity till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Where did I say I'm going to read to? Verse 16, yes. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them for in doing this. What's the impact? You will save both yourself and those who hear you. It's bigger than us. It's big in us, but it's bigger than us. The impact that's being talked about. That is the power of God's Holy Spirit at work. Take heed to doctrine. Continue in them, save yourself and others. And it's 
that work of the Holy Spirit that's a miracle that will work only if we submit to that power. And on deepening belief, after God outlined his covenant with ancient Israel as they exited slavery from Egypt, Israel witnessed an abundance of extraordinary miracles God performed for them. However, they did not value what was done and were wayward and disrespectful. We never, right? We never want to sit there and take for granted the privilege and the beauty of the exposure to God's truth for granted. We never want to do that. God was at one point ready to destroy all of Israel because they just were doing everything wrong in contrast to what he was doing right for them. And what did Moses do when that happened? Moses humbly pleaded on their behalf, asking for their forgiveness. And in some cases, there's some situations where he actually aligned himself with stuff he wasn't doing to say, look, I'm part of this group. I'm part of these people. Please give us, give us mercy, right? You know, let's see, where am I at? Next page. Remember also that at the end of the desert wanderings, only Joshua and Caleb from the older generation were allowed to cross into the promised land. Why was that? Well, Joshua was appointed to be the leader, right? So that's, that's a done deal. But Caleb, Caleb, there's specifically a statement that's made about him in Numbers chapter 14. And if this could be said about every last one of us, wouldn't that be wonderful? And I think on a lot of levels, it can be said. Numbers chapter 14, verse 20 through 24. Fourteen, verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. They cer certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. And this verse 24, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. What a wonderful thing. It says Caleb had a different spirit. What was different? What was different? Caleb believed God when he spoke, and he fully believed God, and his convictions ran deep. The roots were so deep in him about what God said and what he promised that it didn't matter what the obstacle looked like was going to be. Caleb was all in. He says, let's do it. Let's go in. How about us? Do we keep God's promises in our mind? And are we ready to say, let's do it, let's go in, when God says it's time to go? Or do we see the obstacles and say, eh, you know, maybe not. I hope we're a, of a different spirit, as is, you know, said about Caleb, than most would be. Question, what did God want of Israel? What does God want of us? And the answer to those questions is that he wants us to deepen our convictions in his word, his truth, his way, his promises, his plan for us and all mankind. And how do we do that? It's only through the miracle of the power of the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, that we have a chance to do that because this world will wear us down. It is not made to build your faith. <laughs> this world, the God, small g God of this age, 
I'm telling you, he's coming for you. He's gunning for you. And he wants to erode your faith. He wants to take away the impact of God's miracle in you of what his Holy Spirit is leading you to know and to do. Deuteronomy chapter four. Deuteronomy chapter four. Verses three through nine. Deuteronomy 4, verse 3. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, we can be instructed by this statement. Be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Not their own wisdom, not their own understanding, something that was delivered to them, a gift. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it? as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law, which I set before you this day? The law is not a burden. The law brings freedom. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Not one day should go by where you wake up from your little Betty by time where you don't think God has given me this gift today and the things that he does in your background, the blessings that he's blessed you with, the gift of the breath of life, the beauty of being able to see, hear, touch, smell, feel, move. God has given us these things and he wants us to use them to look into his word, to live out his way and to praise him for the gift that he's given us. And then it goes on and this is where we usually focus in in Deuteronomy you know, chapter four. Teach them to your children and your grandchildren. How do you teach something that you yourself don't know and practice? Good question. Right? Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Doesn't work so well. Another question. One thing I wanted to make a point on this is in here it says, don't forget the things that your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. It's a matter of not letting these things depart from the deepest, most inner recesses of our being. Keep them in your heart. They're beautiful. There's something that the wellspring of our life emanates from God's spirit, putting these things in our heart. Another question, as the influence of God's spirit works to teach us God's way, how is it that our belief is deepened? I hear you, right? It's like what was brought to us in that wonderful first message. I hear you. I kind of understand it. Yep, I got you. I responded, right? It's through our resolve to obey God through trial and testing. No matter what, no matter who's watching or not watching, are we taking God's words and applying them and doing those things always? And especially when resistance comes or it's not that comfortable, right? Where does growth come from? Growth is not when we're just skating along and everything's hunky-dory. Growth happens in discomfort, right? Growth is not comfortable. It's something we need to be struggling against to be able to overcome not staying true 
to the things that we know to be doing. We need to be tested in our beliefs. And it's not an easy thing, right? It's like, why, is stuff, why does stuff have to be so difficult? Oh, man, I got to put energy to that again. I thought I already did that last week. It was a funny thing. One of the McDaniels kids, um, he went to kindergarten his first week of school. And he went to, to the one day, and everything was great. He came back. How'd you like it? Loved it, right? The next day when he got up to go, or when they got him up, and they were going to take him over to, to kindergarten for his next, his second day, he says, no, I already did kindergarten, right? <laughs> like, you got, you got to go again. <laughs> Sometimes our Christian walk is like that. It's like, yeah, I passed that test. I, I de dealt with that, right? It's like, what? I got to go through this again? It's ongoing for our whole life, right? It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. He's so cute when he when I heard about that. He, he was like, wow. <laughs> you didn't know you're supposed to be there for the whole school year. Love it. I identify with that because when I went to school, I didn't know my own name. They called through the whole roll. My mom probably remembers this. Called through the whole roll and they said, I got one name left on the list and I wasn't answering it because my name was not James, right? And I didn't know that last name that they were trying to say, right? They were butchering it and I didn't even know it anyway. But my name was JJ, right? And they didn't call JJ. So they say, raise your hand when you hear the name. I didn't hear my name. So I, First day of school, I went home with a note pinned on my <laughs> lapel, uh, and they made me learn my name uh, that next week. There was there was this conference, wasn't there, Mom, where they, you guys had to go in, you asked them to say, Jay? They wouldn't do it. They said, no, he's James. So that's how you got James, right? Lots of things you learn in kindergarten. Okay, where was I in my notes? That wasn't in my notes, by the way. Okay, so the answer to how do we deepen our belief, how is our belief deepened, is that it's through our resolve to obey God through trial and testing. We need to be tested in our beliefs. We need to lean into God and ask him to strengthen us to walk ever more upright in his way. So when we're feeling like our backs are against the wall or we're the most ground down by the small g God of this world's impact, that's when we need to be asking for God to strengthen us the most. And been my experience that that's when we're often least likely to have the energy or the desire to reach out. Think about that. When you're feeling worn down, torn down, and just like you're mush, there's nothing left in the tank. Ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit, and you'll see what ends up in your tank and what you're able to do with his power. Deepened beliefs yields deepened convictions. Deepened convictions yields deepened fruit in your life of God's way. Good fruit is what God's spirit should yield in us. And this naturally brings us to our third and last point. And that is God's spirit provides the ability to bear good fruit. You know, do you have good fruit on your own? <laughs> Maybe you got some good things in your life, but how sustained is that? Right? It's especially appropriate for us to focus on our need to be doing that at this time of year as we come to the Feast of Pentecost this next coming week, where this power that works in us the miracle of God's Holy Spirit was first mightily poured forth. Now, there were others that had God's Spirit working with them before that, but wow, what a day it was in that upper room when the wind was blowing in there, which, you know, where to come in? Did they, leave, did they leave a window open? I don't think so, right? You got tongues as of cloven, cloven tongues as a fire over each of these individuals there was a mighty pouring forth and symbolic things happened at that time to show us that this is not something that we need to ignore it's something we need to focus in on god's spirit is the driving force of our bearing good fruit good fruit we should be the peacemakers in our families in the church 
amongst our peers at work, willing to suffer wrong for righteousness sake. You know, we don't have to right fight. We don't have to play tit for tat. You know, the Old Testament where it talked about, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, and some limb for limb, you know, that kind of stuff. That was a limiter, right? Because the natural inclination of man is to say, okay, you hit me, right? With uh, maybe, was I was going to say, one of those little pellet guns, uh, the little rubber BBs, right? Man, I'm ready to get my nuclear button out on you, right? I mean, it's escalation. I mean, yes, that's a big difference between those two, but not so different from the way we think. I'm going to teach you not to mess with me, right? God says, I am your re reward, your rear guard. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I will fight your battles. You don't have to fight it yourself. All you got to do is what God's Spirit leads you to do from the truth of God. Peter instructs us in this. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 and verses 20 through 23. And that's one. Two is over here. There we go. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good, when you have good fruit in your life and things happen and you suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. He didn't do anything wrong. Not one thing. Perfect, sinless life. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. He had every right to. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Nuclear button wasn't pulled out of the, you know, whatever. But committed himself to him, God Almighty, the Father, who judges righteously. What an example. We are to represent Jesus Christ. We bear his name. Christian. We are to be Christ-like. What was he like? That tells us how we're supposed to be. First Peter, still in First Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Not throwing elbows, not saying how I'm going to get you back, <laughs> what you did to me, what I'm going to do to you. That's not being talked about here. Having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary. When somebody uses curse words towards you, is your first reaction to do the contrary and bless them? If not, we need to think about it, because what does this say? Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. If we live a different way, we get a different result. And we put forth what God's way looks like as a living, breathing, walking, talking, in action representation. We are required to become a blessing to all those who know us, even those that are not friendly, even those that revile us, that hate us, that talk down to us, that disparage us. Bless them. Pray for them. Show them blessing in your interactions with them, if at all possible. Our fruit should be manifested in our relationships, our work, and all we do. In that sense, we become teachers of the power of God's Spirit bearing fruit in us. You know, Mr. Bradford, when he was pastor here, way back on, on in the last century, <laughs> He talked about 
show me your relationships and I'll, I'll show you your Christianity and where you're at on the range of it. And I was offended by that. I said, what are you talking about relationships, right? Like, it's true though. The more you think about it, the more, if you're walking the walk and talking the talk and doing the do, you're going to have relationship impacts of that. And that is an evidence of your walk with Christ and the power of God's spirit working in you. We also have David's request as an example. How am I doing on time? Okay, I gotta hurry up here. David's request is an example about God's spirit in himself. Psalm 51, Psalm 51. You know, this Bible is a real page turner. 51. There we go. And verses 10 through 12. This is David's words, which, you know, we think about at Passover time. We align ourselves with these thoughts. There's a point in here that I want to bring out. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous, your generous spirit. Uphold me with your generous spirit. It's not like God just gave us a little bit of Holy Spirit, a little bit of himself. He's generous with it. As much as we desire it, as much as we desire it to have an impact in our lives, the more he will give it, the more impact it will have. And he can uphold us in things that we would not be able to do any other way. This spirit in Hebrew has the sense of constant, steady, determined. It's not a willy-nilly spirit. And we, likewise, should not be willy-nilly Christians. We need to be constant, steady, determined. What should be the result of our like request to what King David asked? Well, it's in verse 13. Verse 13 says what? Then I, David, will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. We will be able then to reach out to help others with like circumstances and encourage them to follow that same path and ask for God's help with whatever they're facing. God's spirit provides those abilities and so much more. And we will hear more about that, I'm sure, next week. For now, as we wind down to a conclusion, a couple of things, well, a few things. I can't say a couple, because that would limit it to two, right? If I say a few, a little bit of water, all right. God is the fountain of living waters. He alone defines what our life is about, what we are, and what our purpose is, what we're destined to become. He alone defines what leads us and all mankind to find true joy in this life and the one to come. And it's in the book. And it's in the leading of God's spirit to help us to understand what he means by what's in the book. It's not the miracles that save. It's not the miracles that save. We like miracles. Humans love a good miracle, right? But it's humility that saves. Our humility in relation to our Father and His Spirit working in us and His sacrifice, the sacrifice of His Son. Moses had humility. Caleb had humility. And we can be instructed by those two. And to that end, God has graced us with the power of his Holy Spirit. As we have rehearsed today, he has placed his spirit within us. His spirit flowing to us, in us, and through us. To address our weaknesses, to overcome, to deepen our faith and belief, to learn and to know, and to teach us to witness on his behalf, to represent him. 
and to move us to bear good fruit, to do good. The good fruit has to be there. The bad fruit has to be pruned away. What's the heart of the matter? It's our heart for God and God's heart for us. We often turn to Jeremiah 17 to read just verse 9 about the heart. But let us read beyond that just a few verses. Jeremiah 17, in verse 10, and we will read through verse 13. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And if we are allowing God's Holy Spirit to work in us, that will be good fruit that we will have given to us according to as a partridge that broods but does not hatch so is he who gets riches but not by right it will leave him in the midst of his days and at his end he will be a fool a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary O lord the hope of israel all who forsake you shall be ashamed those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the lord the fountain of living waters. Give to man according to his ways. If our ways are informed by the book, led by the Spirit of God who gives it to us, those will be wonderful gifts that will be given to us. God and his Spirit are equated to a fountain of living waters. Let us meditate on the power of what God's Spirit dwelling in us is able to do. And let it truly be, as God intended, a flowing fountain of living waters for learning, overcoming, witnessing, and bearing good fruit. One last passage I'll cite to you as I close. 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 and 7. And if you're following the path to Pentecost uh, beyond today, extras, they're not dailies, they're extras. The last one closes with this verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. And this happens in all Bible-defined baptisms. That gift of the Holy Spirit is given. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's all be stirred up to take some purposeful time this next week before the wonderful and meaningful coming Feast of Pentecost to dwell on what God's Holy Spirit does in us.